and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. It's been nearly 70 years since the creation of the State of Israel led to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians becoming refugees in their own land. The UN Works Relief Agency for Palestinian Refugees is the primary UN body that deals with the plight of Palestinian refugees, works to provide um, food, employment, and uh, in general to look after their welfare, uh, and has uh, been the oldest UN agency dealing with refugees anywhere in the world since it was set up in 1950. Uh, the UNRWA is headed by Pierre Cranbull, and we are very lucky to have uh, Mr. Cranbull in the studio today to discuss with us yeah. the work of the agency. Welcome to the show, sir. Very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Cranbull, tell us, to begin with, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, a little bit about the history of the UNRWA. Um, as I had said, this is one of the first times that the UN got involved actively in uh, providing protection and relief for refugees. Uh, how is it that the UNRWA came into being in the first place? Well, you said it in your introduction. And the State of Israel is created, and uh, as a result of uh, the Arab-Israeli war at the time in 1948, uh, 700,000 Palestinians were displaced from their homes, their villages or fled, and ended up in what is today Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine, the occupied Palestinian territory. And uh, UNRWA was established uh, in 1949-50 and began its operations in the beginning, of course, as a temporary institution to help in expecting and waiting for a political solution that would allow people to return to their villages and their homes. That was the idea at the time. Now, of course, the focus was, as you said, relief in the beginning, but then very rapidly we delivered a series of services that were almost like a state delivers services to a community, uh, education, healthcare, relief and social services, and this is what we continue to do today, now almost 68 years later, and I think it's very important for people to think about what it means for a population to have been a refugee population for so long. You know, I think about coming to India, for instance, what strikes me, it coincides almost with the, the date of the yes. Indian independence. Yes. So every Indian citizen can reflect on you know, the pride of having established your own nation, the pride of having invested in shaping your own destiny, taking things into your own hands, and going through so many huge achievements from political to agricultural, from technological to others, and defining what your own future is. And here's a community, in the meantime, over five million Palestine refugees. Right, so the seven and a half uh, hundred thousand has grown over the years, as you would imagine. That's right. Yeah. You know, for, of course, the children have been you know, born yeah. into these yeah. families. And in the meantime, it's 5.2 million. So if I take a comparison, which in Indian numerical terms is, is maybe not huge, but it's almost the population of Kolkata. So if, you know, that we have a direct responsibility for, and this is the population of Singapore that UNRWA takes care of. In, in, its, in a sense, not just of the emergency relief, yeah. but really investing in education also in the future of young children. So this is the focus of the agency. So, That's where it so came just up. to be clear, if, if we're talking about 5 million plus, um, quote, I mean, technically classified as Palestinian refugees correct. who come under the uh, mandate of your agency, That's correct. Uh, are these people uh, physically living in camps or uh, is there a diaspora now of, of refugees? who are around the world who still uh, would obviously come under the mandate or broader protection of UNRWA? So at the 5 million, yeah. you will find 1.2 million living in Gaza, approximately 750,000 in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, then just around 2 million in Jordan, currently still about 450,000 in Syria, and just around 300,000 in Lebanon. You will find Palestine refugees registered with UNRWA that have moved further afield, uh, also as a result of the Syrian conflict, which we may address uh, at a later stage. But um, those are the five million are in the region, and we have direct uh, responsibility for them. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, um, the political context, obviously, when, uh, uh, when Resolution 194 was passed by the General Assembly back in 1949, and subsequently UNRWA was created, um, Give us a sense of the political context. The Israel-Palestine issue is hugely divisive. For 70 years, it's been enmeshed in Cold War politics of one kind or the other. How easy or difficult has it been for UNRWA over the years to navigate itself through 
the very, very choppy waters of regional geopolitics. I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we face because it is a highly emotional, very polarized uh, region where, of course, whatever you do or don't do or say or don't say is going to be picked apart by a variety of stakeholders and, and actors. And I think, you know, for Palestine refugees themselves and therefore for our operations, the continued existence of occupation mm. in Palestine itself, the repeated wars in Gaza, or currently, of course, the absolutely catastrophic conflict in Syria, have broken the community into so many parts. It really you know, takes a, a deep understanding to think now about what it means for Palestine refugees who have been in Syria for the better part of 65 years, who were generally welcome there, had access to employment, created businesses in many of the camps in which they uh, lived and had the satisfaction, although they couldn't uh, go home, but they had the satisfaction of self-sufficiency and the dignity of having an employment that would cover the needs of their families. And yet today, of course, they are another generation of Palestinians that have faced the trauma of displacement, yes. loss of friends, loss of neighbors, loss of property, loss of income and livelihood, and find themselves in you know, the next phase of the indignity of displacement and also of the fear of a very uncertain future. So this runs very deep through the entire community and I think it's something that the world you know, should remember and therefore not run the risk of neglecting because there's a very high price <coughs> for stability in West Asia if one did neglect the plight. What's the, what's the estimate of the number of Palestinian refugees uh, presently, uh, currently in Syria itself? So there were 560,000 Palestine refugees right. before the war in Syria. Um, approximately 65% have been displaced because of the war. Uh, roughly 120,000 have left the country entirely. The majority to fled to Lebanon and Jordan, where we have now hosted them in other camps and provide the services to them there. But about half of those who fled have gone to other countries, so Turkey, Egypt, some have managed to reach Europe, others have uh, ended up in Brazil or in Asia. And, and do, they do, do they remain enrolled with UNRWA in some way or do you, do, do you then lose your link with them? It's a very interesting point. <coughs> they, they remain registered as refugees, which you know, allows them if they were able to return to the region to continue to receive the services. But it's true, strictly speaking, our mandate in operational terms, mm -hmm. in, in the sense of delivering services, is limited to the areas Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Palestine. So if they cross into other areas, they would then fall under the uh, mandate of the UNHCR, right. the High Commissioner of Refugees. Right. And uh, in terms of physical security for the uh, Palestinian refugees that are still in Syria, uh, tell us a little bit about the challenges that your agency faces. I mean, I know there have been a few incidents. Uh, I was reading about uh, a safe zone for children, for example, that came under shelling, uh, which affected Palestinian refugees. Um, are there any figures of casualties, for example, have Palestinian refugees in Syria fallen victim to the civil war? Um, have you had any luck in your dialogue or negotiations with the Syrian government or with the numerous re rebel groups that uh, they should be mindful of uh, the fact that Palestinian refugees are living there? It's a very important point because there has, there's a region to the south of Damascus called Yarmouk, which is, one has to imagine that as a neighborhood of a, of a city, okay. but which was an area which um, 160,000 Palestine refugees lived before uh, the war started. It is now one of the most embattled areas of uh, the, the capital. It's a landscape, and I have visited uh, many areas of conflict uh, over the last 25 years uh, working in humanitarian work, but it is one of the most devastated landscapes I've seen because uh, in 2012, 2013, armed groups of the opposition entered the camp. It was besieged. There was strong fighting. And today, there are only uh, a few thousand that remain. So they have been displaced. So yes, Palestine refugees have been deeply marked and affected by the conflict. You know, there's a lot of focus currently on Aleppo in the north. Mm -hmm. There are roughly 30 to 35,000 Palestine refugees in the north. Some of them are still in areas that are relatively safe. Others are in the town of Aleppo. And so, of course, our teams there are working and providing much needed services, but also at great risk. UNRWA itself has lost 18 staff members in Syria, in Syria since the beginning of the war, and we have 25 missing. That's one of the highest... That's a huge number. Costs. It's a huge uh, number, uh, and really it shows both the readiness of our staff, most of them Palestinians themselves, 
to take great risk when it is to serve the community, but it also says something about uh, the brutality of the conflict in Syria itself. Right. Now, now, give us a sense of the uh, overall size of, of UNRWA and the kind of budget that you operate with. Right. Um, do you get funded from the UN general budget, or is there a specific allocation? Can countries make contributions directly to UNRWA? And if so, uh, d does politics come into play there? I read that the Harper government, uh, when it was in charge of Canada, had decided to cut off funding, but there's some talk of the Canadians now coming back in again. Uh, is the source, is, is the um, uh, drive to get UNRWA's work funded properly also part of your mandate and your struggle? <laughs> it's certainly a part of the struggle. Um, so UNRWA has, uh, is one of the largest UN civilian agencies. We employ 30,000 people. Now, that's a large number and needs to be briefly explained. We have 22,000 people working in education because it is the core of the uh, activities that we provide for Palestine refugees. We have 500,000 Palestinian boys and girls in 700 schools across the Middle East. Uh, the World Bank has just recently produced a very in positive... So, so these are all UNRWA schools? Right? These are all UNRWA okay. schools. We run them entirely. So the, the school principals, the teachers, the education specialists, the guards, whatever you mm -hmm. can think of that is needed for education, they're all employed by UNRWA proper. And we have 22,000 of those engaged in education. About and this would be primary up to secondary? It's uh, from you know, so the age of 6 to 16. Right. So yes, okay. you go all yeah. the way across. And then we do have also some technical vocational training, which is, by the way, something which I would be, uh, I'd be very keen to discuss here in India to think about how can we cooperate further in that. So those are the 30,000 staff. We spend approximately 1.2 to 1.3 billion dollars a year for all of our activities. For the core services, that's about 700 million for the schools, the clinics that we run, the social services. And that money uh, comes essentially through voluntary contributions from member states. So the percentage that we receive from the UN's general budget is a very small percentage. Okay. And this is something, by the way, that would be worth looking at because I think at the beginning it was understandable because the UN thought this is a temporary institution. Now, of course, 68 years later, one also has to recognize that UNRWA is providing a huge measure of dignity and stability for a very unstable community in a very unstable West Asia. Mm -hmm. And the, if I were to get into a practical issue of school curricula, I mean, is there a UN system or do you follow the curricula of Jordan if you're in Jordan or Correct, Syria yes. if you're in Syria? So we, we apply the national curricula of the country that you're in. Of the country, okay. but of course we have gone through significant reforms in which we have, for example, been the only agency in West Asia to add a human rights curriculum, mm -hmm. for example. It's, it's a very innovative approach. We also have, of course, we check that the curriculum and the things that we teach in the UNRWA schools are consistent with UN values. I mean, this is very important. But it's very important for the children to be able to learn in the national context because when they go to higher education, exactly. they have to be able to connect. And in terms of learning outcomes, would you say that graduation rates, performance levels uh, of kids in these schools is comparable to the national uh, environment in which they're in? Or is it better or worse given the fact that they are from a relatively more unstable uh, background socially? I mean, it's regularly reviewed. A recent report by the World Bank, which, by the way, does not fund UNRWA, so it's, I think uh, we can look at it as, as, a, as a fair source. And this you know, concluded that children who study in UNRWA schools in Jordan, the West Bank, and in Gaza outperform, and this is a quote, students in national curricula and in national schools okay. in these three by a full year of learning. Wow. So it's a remarkable investment. And I have to tell you, this is something that I discovered when I joined UNRWA. I had not worked in education-related fields uh, previously. And what I've discovered is the extraordinary, uh, most visionary dimension that UNRWA added to its services very early on. By focusing on education, you don't look at young people only as being the victims of a historic injustice, which mm. they are. Mm. But you also look at them as actors of their own destiny, mm. who can take a certain number of things into their own hands, who can shape the future. And when I meet children mm. in the UNRWA schools, whether it's in Gaza or Syria, mm. the passion that is there, the hope to be able to contribute to something meaningful in mm. the future, the desire to be recognized like children anywhere else on the planet. You know, when the UN Secretary General visited Gaza recently, and met with members of our school parliaments, young boys and girls. 
he was talking about human rights. And at one point, a young boy looked at him and said, Secretary General, we are learning about human rights in UNRWA schools. The only question we have is, why do they not apply to us? And I think this is something, again, where the world has to look at these young boys and girls, you know, go beyond the anonymity of numbers and see the humanity of individuals so that this starts to make more sense. Uh, Mr. Karmul, many, many viewers in India uh, shared the shock and horror of people around the world uh, at the images of destruction that we saw in Gaza, or that we've seen, I should say, repeatedly in Gaza, every time Israel uh, has attacked uh, the territory, Palestinian territory there. Um, what we saw in 2014 was uh, really horrible in terms of the damage to physical infrastructure. There was also incredible loss of life. And there were a number of incidents where um, it has been alleged credibly that uh, UNRWA facilities, uh, a school, uh, other facilities were either deliberately targeted or that the Israeli defense forces did not use adequate, uh, did not take adequate precautions in order to ensure that civilians were not hurt by military action. Uh, I know that this is an issue that you've raised with the Israeli side. Um, recently, the Israeli Defense Forces decided that in the case of the school attack, uh, everything was fine. There was, there was no need to have any kind of criminal action. Uh, how hopeful are you of any kind of acknowledgement by the Israeli government that its method of conducting war is deeply flawed and that civilians are being put in harm's way? Or do you think this whole thing is going to be brushed under the carpet? So two things on this. The first part of your comment, which was about the 2014 and the, the impact itself, the, the destruction and everything. The one thing that I'd like viewers to have in mind is that you can think about the images of destruction at the time and one could look at photographs of today and see which areas have been physically rebuilt or not. So you can see the physical yeah. destruction. But people have to remember what it means for individuals. You cannot map out the psychological impact that it has on people in Gaza to not only have gone through these repeated conflicts, have seen the destruction. It's also, for example, for children, 90% of our school children in Gaza, and we have 250,000 boys and girls in our schools, have never left the Gaza Strip in their lives. Now, this is such a minuscule territory, overcrowded already today, so not to mention how it will be in 20 or 40 years from now. And children cannot leave. You almost have no employment opportunities. Last year, UNRWA tried to recruit 200 new teachers for its school. We had 22,000 qualified applicants because there are no other jobs to have. So it's also the human mm. consequences that need to be thought about. And then to come to the point on the, uh, the ways in which UNRWA schools were affected. So we spoke about it during the war. We denounced it during the war when our schools were hit. We also denounced when our schools were misused by... Uh, in well, certain Hamas, cases, yeah. Palestinian groups mm -hmm. that placed weapons components in three of our schools. So I want to be very clear here again. It's a matter now of public record because the Secretary General of the United Nations conducted a board of investigation, board of inquiry, and he found uh, that in these instances, indeed, uh, over 40 people lost their lives and over 200 were injured in uh, instances where UNRWA schools were hit uh, by Israeli artillery. And it is true that in the recent statement about one of the schools in Rafah in the south, where the Israeli Defense Forces have concluded that there was no responsibility on their side, it is very important to remind everyone that when engaging in warfare, there are rules to be applied. And when one engages in highly and densely populated areas, where the risk of exposing civilians, mm. the risk of not being able to distinguish between legitimate military targets and civilian installations or civilians, accountability is needed. And any sign in our perspective that you know, responsibilities would be evaded or in any other sense would be a matter of great concern. Now, UNRWA is neither a judge nor a tribunal. That we need to let to others uh, to look into. But I really continue to call for accountability in each of these cases, because at least from the perspective of those families who lost relatives mm. in these attacks, mm. there is a real risk that they certainly right. feel that right. justice has been denied. Right. Uh, I know that the um, International Criminal Court is beyond UNRWA's remit, but we know that Palestine uh, acceded to the Rome Statute and would very much like the ICC to uh, investigate and prosecute uh, all, all individuals who might have committed war crimes uh, in, during 2014 and earlier. Uh, if the ICC were to decide to do that, uh, as a UN agency, I suppose UNRWA would be free to cooperate and to present whatever evidence it has? Well, this is certainly what we decided to do with the Israeli 
investigations because indeed the first responsibility lies with the national institutions to ensure accountability. And so we did uh, provide uh, evidence and in the way work together with the fact-finding and assessment mission that was established by the Israeli Defense right. Force. <coughs> now we have this result. It is true, as far as the ICC con is concerned, that's certainly something that uh, the Palestinian Authority is responsible for. Right. And, you know, we will wait for whatever developments. Right. It's really right. beyond UNRWA. Right. Now, you know, given the work that you do, it isn't surprising that uh, people in Israel, some sections of Israeli society, political society, We'd ob would object to, uh, to UNRWA's activities, uh, make all kinds of accusations. Uh, recently, I've seen repeated attacks on UNRWA by uh, fairly senior uh, you know, former Minister of Finance, Yair Lapid, and uh, former, uh, former uh, Shin Bet director, uh, Abhi Dikta, uh, making allegations that uh, most workers, uh, most UNRWA workers in, in, in the Gaza Strip uh, are all Hamas terrorists. Uh, how do you deal with these kinds of allegations? Does it worry you that responsible Israeli politicians are trying to erase uh, boundaries between the obviously very legitimate work that you do and uh, the political military work or activities of an organization like Hamas, which obviously the Israelis consider to be a legitimate target? Does this worry you that the line is being erased uh, in the minds of some Israeli politicians? Well, in a way, the examples you've given are a reminder of how polarized the situation is and how emotional and how continually we are confronted with, uh, you know, comments. And by the way, it's from Israeli commentators and uh, politicians at times. It is from international associations. Sometimes we have critical remark in other countries. Well, sometimes, to be very frank, we're also uh, being challenged by Palestinians on mm -hmm. some of the services mm -hmm. or changes that we make. So we do operate in that. Mm -hmm. But to come to the specific part, first of all, we have to remember, it is the mandate of UNRWA is not something that anybody can play with. Mm. It is anchored in the UN General Assembly. Yes. So we, we draw our legitimacy not from something self-declared. Yeah. We draw it from a mandate that was given by the community of states yeah. to address a fundamental problem that, by the way, why are we still here? Yeah. Not because UNRWA has any intention of saying, Refugees need to remain refugees, not because any refugee, and I have never in my entire humanitarian career met a refugee who wishes to remain a refugee. Yes. And I can tell you when I go to the communities of Palestine refugees, they're not asking me, please help us to stay refugees. Yeah. They want somebody to take their situation seriously in the international community to deliver on its promise to resolve this issue exactly. politically. And this is where, of course, the catastrophic failure of the international community in its broader sense but frankly, also of you know, those who today maybe at times wish to question UNRWA, I think would be well served to focus on, on addressing the fundamentals. Absolutely. Because in a way, to put it like this, we can close our eyes on the issue now. And then we can open our eyes in five years again. And the situation will yeah. only be worse. Because do we need really to look even further at all of the instability yeah. in, the, in West Asia to convince ourselves? that when you fail to address political circumstances politically, yeah. you get, well, you get 68 years of UNRWA, yeah. but you also get all of the ongoing problems right. in the community. Right. So this is really what I, my message would be. I never had a problem to be challenged. And I, by the way, sit down frequently, including recently, with senior Israeli military people. And every time I also raise the question, is there anything that you have, to, you know, you think you right. have to say to right. me about any of our staff? Right. Is there any? Right. And there is currently nothing. So to simply put out general and generic information to accuse UNRWA is not sufficient. Right. And in particular, to overlook one's responsibility in political terms, right. that is certainly the most uh, serious uh, issue. This is your first visit to India as UNRWA chief. And... Palestine and the Palestinian cause has always been close to uh, the hearts of people in India. Um, in the minute or so that we have left, uh, what is it that people in India could do, the government of India could do to assist UNRWA, the work, the work that you're doing uh, to assist Palestinian refugees in general? India is doing quite a lot, but is there something targeted or specific that we could do that would help uh, your work? The first thing I'm very interested to learn more for, about the Indian perspective when looking at West Asia, when looking at the Palestinian issue, when looking at Palestine refugees. The Indian voice has to be heard in this context. This is very important. And what I find the most important is that we don't allow, and here I'm sure India can play a role, 
this issue of Palestine refugees to kind of be set aside saying, you know, it's an old issue. As I hear sometimes in, in ministries when I travel internationally, saying it's an old issue. We have now more pressing things to do with Syria and Libya and Yemen and many other places. Um, and to think that, you know, this issue is just going to go away by itself. I think it requires, on the contrary, a lot of political attention because investing in a political solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict mm. is an investment in regional and more global security. Mm. It would help address and find an appropriate solution for Palestine refugees, bring the dignity to a community that has been denied dignity and rights for too long. And I think in India's historic experience, there is certainly uh, a great contribution to be made in that regard. Right. Mr. Granbull, we're completely out of time, but it's been fascinating talking Thank to you. you. Thank so you so much, much for it's your time. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.